Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Alison Stokes, who's Programme Lead for BSc Environmental Science and BSc Environmental Management and Sustainability at the University of Plymouth. She's also our very valued, one of our very valued chairs, vice chairs. So over, you, over to you, Alison, you're going to talk about equality, diversity, inclusion, and provide an overview to the benchmark statement on that. Thank you, Alison. Hey, brilliant. Thank you, Liz. And yeah, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, so I was part of the working group within the ES3 advisory group that was looking at embedding EDI in this new revised benchmark statement. Um, and this issue of embedding EDI is linked to this wider issue that we have in HE at the moment around addressing inequalities that can lead to differing programme experiences for our students and consequently um, the attainment gaps. So this is significant that we're introducing EDI because if you go back and look at any of the previous versions of our ES3 subject benchmark statement, there's no mention of equality, diversion, uh, diversity and inclusivity at all in any context. So if we just pop back and look at the 2019 benchmark statement, we find that there are actually mentions of sustainability, um, specifically in relation to environmental knowledge. We find that there are some references to careers and employability um, throughout the statement, but nothing at all about EDI. So really anything was gonna be um, an improvement on this. So as Sean has said, um, in this version of the benchmark statement, EDI is embedded as a key cross-cutting theme along with sustainability and employability. And we find it embedded in the four main sections of the benchmark statement. So these sections deal with context and characteristics of our programme, the distinctive features, the content structure and delivery, and finally, the benchmark standards. So the key headlines relating to each of these sections are that EDI is now recognised as being characteristic of an ES3 degree with respect to both subject knowledge and practice. The statement recognises the challenges linked to our distinctive pedagogies, such as lab work and field work. It emphasises the need to be inclusive in all aspects of teaching, learning and assessment. And finally, there is specific reference to EDI within our benchmark standards. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is just say a little bit more about the specific EDI related content. And I'm gonna show you basically some screen grabs from the benchmark statement of the text within each of the sections that, that talk about EDI. Um, it's gonna be a bit of a whiz through, but hopefully it's gonna give a sense of where and how it's addressed. So first of all, in terms of context and characteristics of an ES3 degree, in terms of the broad context, I mean, ultimately what we're aiming to do within our subjects and within our programmes is to cultivate graduates with knowledge attributes to address global sustainability challenges. And so knowledge about equality, diversity and inclusivity and how this then translates into professional practice is a really critical aspect of this. So right from the very outset in the benchmark statement, we're given a very clear sense about how these three themes dovetail together to inform um, the ES3 programmes. And then we have this section, um, which is specifically focused around equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and this makes a very clear statement about EDI being integral to the ES3 disciplines, both in terms of subject knowledge and our pedagogic practice. So with respect to practice, this sets out our responsibility to address barriers to engagement and participation by diverse groups and to ensure that the learning environments that we cultivate and that we provide are safe and supportive for all students. 
And within the ES3 statement, when we refer to diverse groups, we're considering all protected characteristics. So we actually made a very conscious decision within the advisory group not to make specific reference in our statement to particular groups or particular protected characteristics. We consider all students together. In terms of context, there are multiple ways that we can address EDI and some of the examples given are challenging discipline identities, uh, embedding diverse representation, broadening our perspectives and then valuing these different perspectives, maybe through a cultural lens, through ways of knowing and lived experience. And our statement also refers to um, ES3 as being a route to justice through delivery of the sustainable development goals. So it's making a very clear link here with sustainability. Um, and that by developing these graduate attributes, we can contribute to addressing global grand challenges in a way that creates a fairer and more equal world. So by considering people as well as processes. So again, a really nice example of how the three key themes are kind of being woven together within our statement. So one of the really key distinctive features of ES3 is the emphasis that we have on practical learning and practical skills and the need for our learning to be designed in a way that's inclusive for all students. Um, and our statement makes specific reference to decolonizing the curriculum and to recognizing um, that differential experiences can lead to inequalities of outcomes. So this is kind of a recurring theme that we find popping up um, throughout the benchmark statement. And this section on design then um, leads into a section on accessibility, which digs into this issue of inclusive design and pedagogy a little bit deeper. And one of the really important things that this particular part of the statement recognizes is that the challenges faced by students um, are often intersectional. So they emerge as a result of our students um, having multiple protected characteristics. And this can make our job as practitioners um, having to practice inclusive design incredibly challenging. So the statement emphasizes that inclusivity should be part of our normal pedagogic practice, but it's also recognizing that reasonable adjustments may still be needed in some circumstances, and particularly in relation to lab work and field work where this is often where the activities that students encounter, well, these are often the activities where students are most likely to encounter barriers to participation. So in this case, um, we might look to offer a range of means for students to access learning. So this could include technology assisted and blended approaches. And it also specifies that we can also consider the risks faced by diverse groups through risk assessments, um, which looks specifically at protected characteristics. And this is all within the broader context of considering health, safety and well-being. So in terms of subject content, so this is about our subject knowledge, it's expected that all of these subjects, uh, all students in ES3 subjects will acquire EDI specific knowledge relating to both the nature of their subject and to its practice. So it specifies that it's expected our students will acquire an understanding of ethical issues around legacy, uses of the discipline, engaging contemporary debates and appreciating the need for decolonization, and then an appreciation of how this then translates into practice by recognizing the importance of equality, diversity, and inclusive, inclusivity. So this is very much about subject knowledge. And then in relation to pedagogic practice, these sections around teaching and learning really reinforce the need to be inclusive of all students and to imply, uh, to, for us to apply inclusive practice, both in general, 
and also specifically in relation to our characteristic pedagogies. So we have this paragraph which talks specifically about fieldwork and um, this is perhaps one of the most significant changes or the most important changes from the previous version of the benchmark statement because the previous benchmark statement said that it was impossible for students to develop a satisfactory understanding of ES3 without significant exposure to field-based learning and teaching and related assessment. And what this latest version um, specifies is that fieldwork is still compulsory. It's critical to developing subject knowledge and understanding and the graduate attributes relevant to employability and entrepreneurship. But the language has been softened, so it now refers to offering all students opportunities for significant field based learning, recognising that these need to be inclusive and may still require reasonable adjustments. So the key message is still very similar to the previous version, but there's been some moderation of the tone to reflect this much more inclusive approach. And these themes of flexibility and inclusive design are also embedded in the statement around assessment, again, recognising the need for modifications and reasonable adjustments in some cases. So finally, in section four within the benchmark statements, this is where we see the inclusion of EDI within threshold criteria. And in our benchmark statement, this is specific to personal and professional skills. And this particular threshold criteria links directly to the statements about expected content for ES4, ES3 programmes, which is about recognising the importance of EDI and how this then translates through to professional practice. And just out of interest, I did carry out a quick comparison of all the subject benchmark statements that were reviewed um, in 2021, just to see where EDI is featured. Um, and this kind of links back to what Sean was saying in her talk about um, the freedom we were given to introduce these themes in a way which very much reflects our own subjects. And what's interesting is that pretty much all of the subjects um, in this first tranche have included EDI explicitly within sections one, two and three, but only eight out of the 14 have actually chosen to embed EDI within their benchmark standards. So this is where we kind of see some diversity of approach and where we do find EDI included within the benchmark standards it's usually in relation to either subject knowledge or professional skills so I thought that was kind of quite an interesting um, quite an interesting thing to look at. Alison you've just got a couple of minutes. Thank Brilliant you. thanks Bex. So in terms of useful resources um, there are a whole wealth of resources that I could signpost you to. So rather than give a page that was completely rammed with URLs, I've just highlighted two here. So the first is the Advanced HE webpage on EDI, which is a really helpful springboard onto further sources of much more detailed help and information around particular protected characteristics. And in terms of fieldwork, I think the Royal Geographical Principles for Undergraduate Field Courses is an excellent resource to be referring to, and particularly principle number four, which speaks specifically to accessible and inclusive fieldwork. And then the final thing that I wanted to do right at the end was to finish by clarifying the difference between access and inclusion, because these two terms are often used interchangeably, but they do actually sit on a continuum, and the different points in this continuum also tie into some of the other terminology that is used both within the benchmark statements and more broadly. And so this is just a series of three images um, that show this continuum really nicely. So we can think of these three people as being our diverse group of students. 
the baseball game is some kind of uh, pedagogic activity. I've used this to talk about inclusive fieldwork before, but really this could be anything. Um, the fence is a barrier to participation and these boxes are accommodations or reasonable adjustments. So we can provide accommodations that make participation possible. So we can make this baseball game accessible for the viewers by providing these boxes to see over the fence. But if we take the fence away, or even better, if it's not there in the first place, that participation then just becomes inclusive for everybody. So the key point here is that if you make something accessible, it's not necessarily going to be inclusive, but if you design something to be inclusive from the outset, it should always be accessible for everybody. So on that point, um, I'd just like to say thank you everybody for, for listening. I hope that's been a helpful insight into how EDI has been embedded into the subject benchmark statement. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to, to take any questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen there. Many thanks, Alison. That was incredibly helpful. Uh, while we're just waiting for some questions to come in, I have a question. So I'm sorry, my dogs are barking again. Can you give us some tips from your, your experience and your expertise on how really we can make field work and practical work more inclusive by design? That would be really helpful. It's a big question, I know. <laughs> that is a massive question. And it's kind of, where do you start? I think it just comes from having an awareness and appreciation for the, the different challenges that students are likely to face and thinking about the different ways that, um, yeah, that they could be accommodated within what it is you're trying to deliver. Um, so offering multiple means of access. So thinking about the fact that, I think one of the things that we, we, we tend to do in our subjects is we, we privilege sight as being the primary sense. And actually for a lot of students, um, they, they might prioritize other senses. So it's, it's trying to find ways to make things multi-sensory, to think about different ways of representation. So, um, yeah, thinking about the fact that people learn at different rates, that some students might find it more helpful to prepare before a class, um, whereas others might value having things to go back to. Um, yeah, there's no easy answer to that, Liz. Um, it's, a, it's a big question. It all depends on what you want to do, why you want to do it, how it's going to be assessed, what the, what the kind of role of it in the curriculum might be. Thank you, but the, the ERGS guidance is a useful starting point. Oh, I it's think. fantastic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, brilliant. We've got a couple of comments. So one is we're seeing more students with significant mental health difficulties, which can mm. be very challenging in the context of residential field learning. And, and this would be a really useful specific of ED and I to share good practice on if anybody's got any experience of that. And then um, finally from Sean, uh, really interesting to see how EDI maps across the four areas of the S, uh, subject benchmark statements in the new uh, 14 new statements. And I think that's really interesting because for us as a professional body, clearly we ask um, programs to map themselves against the, the benchmark statements so it's really interesting how to make sure that none of the aspects are lost um even if they're not actually in in the statements themselves i don't know if you've got any comments on either of those before we move yeah, on. yeah so so just in relation to the um, mental health in residential field work um i've actually been involved in some research into a pilot study into residential field work for students with a, a whole range of, um, of different disabilities and um, protected characteristics. And uh, so that, that's in the process of being written up at the moment. But I think just in general, from my own kind of, from my own practice, um, I am seeing a much greater awareness of the need to be, um, a need to recognize the impacts of mental health on students' experiences with residential fieldwork, a much more awareness among academic staff and kind of willingness to consider this in terms of risk assessment and being flexible with delivery 
Um, I think we are seeing change. We are things, seeing things start to change in really, really important ways. And hopefully these things are just going to gain momentum and they'll continue to become more and more embedded. But yeah, mental health and residential field work, particularly as well in response to the pandemic, which I think has, has shone a huge spotlight onto a lot of these issues. Um, yeah, we, we're going to see some really important changes on these in the future, I think, I hope. Thanks, Alison. We have one final comment. Um, really that um, from Teresa, I also think that a key starting point is to teach to the learning outcomes, allowing students flexibility to demonstrate those, they meet those learning outcomes in ways that work for them. And also thinking about cultural considerations mm -hmm. in the field work.